First Minister, Aberdeen City is back in lockdown after a spike in coronavirus cases. How difficult was it to make that decision? These decisions are horrendously difficult. They're not straightforward. They are very complex, but actually they boil down to uh, the need to take whatever decisions are necessary to keep this virus under control because we know from the bitter experience of the past four months how much damage it can do and the situation in Aberdeen at Test and Protect, the local incident management team, they're working really hard and really effectively but we don't yet have the confidence that it is under control and that it hasn't seeped into the community so taking these steps really gives us the ability to stamp it out and also, and this is a really important part of the decision, protect the ability to get children back to school next week, which I think for everybody is and should be the top priority. You said it was the last thing you wanted to do. That's how you described it. Look, I never wanted to be in a position as First Minister of uh, putting lockdown restrictions on any part of the country. Um, and actually, if I cast my mind back to you know, just the earlier part of this year, I would never have comprehended being in that position but these steps are necessary to try to stop a virus that we know can be deadly and cause you know really bad health for people to to keep it under control we have to do really um, unprecedented and uh, difficult things and saying to people in Aberdeen not to gather in each other's houses is an important way of trying to stem the transmission equally we know this cluster in Aberdeen it seems to be associated with the nighttime economy, people going to pubs and therefore, unfortunately, uh, closing hospitality for a period is another way of trying to help the Test and Protect teams get a grip of this and stop it spreading more widely. But, you know, I, I never wanted to be in the position of doing this. And I think there's a really important message for the public here. You know, I've been saying ad nauseum now for weeks and weeks and weeks that the virus hasn't gone away. We've had reducing numbers of cases, we've had thankfully reducing numbers of deaths, but it's still out there. It's still infectious, it's still dangerous and Aberdeen is a really big wake-up call and people, all of us, every single one of us as citizens has a crucial part to play in keeping it under control. We are the first line of defence so it's really about complying with all of that basic but so important health advice. It's interesting you refer to the start of the year. Who would have imagined this? At the start of the year, a lot of thoughts were on Brexit, but then in February, coronavirus started to make its way across Europe. Knowing the situation in Spain and Italy, do you think it would have been wiser to lock down earlier? Um, oh look, I go over these decisions in my mind uh, almost on a daily basis at the moment, and I can't turn the clock back. I, I think we will get to a point where we will want to look back properly and systematically and learn the lessons and, and be really honest with ourselves. Should we have done things differently? Should we have done things uh, more quickly than we did? Um, but while you're still in a developing situation with a, a real threat, you've got to focus on the here and now. You try to learn lessons as you go, obviously, and I think we've learnt a lot as we've gone along. But at the time, we tried to take the best decisions we could based on the best evidence and applying the best judgment to that. And uh, that's been the case at every single step of the way. One of the most difficult things for all countries in dealing with this virus is, by its very nature, it's a it's a novel virus. So we don't know everything about it. There are things we know now about how it transmits, uh, the contribution of people without symptoms to the transmission of the virus, uh, all sorts of things that we know now that we didn't know then. And actually, we still don't know everything there is to know about it. So we're learning all the time. But none of there's not a single uh, one of these major decisions that has been taken by the Scottish Government over the last few months that I personally haven't agonised over. And I, you know, I, I've said this before, and I actually, I really mean it. Probably for as long as I live, I will, you know, go over in my mind some of the decisions we took and whether we could have took, taken different decisions. Because when more than 4,000 people have lost their lives, which is at this stage the case in Scotland, um, it's inevitable that we're always going to ask ourselves. And it's also important because I hope it's not in my lifetime, uh, but there'll be another pandemic in the future. So we've got to learn as much about the handling of this one as we can to apply that for the future. The University of Edinburgh, they did a study and they said that at least 2,000 lives could have been saved in Scotland if restrictions had been imposed earlier. Do you wish you had diverged from UK government earlier? There's not a lot of point in this. I, I took the decisions I thought were best at the time. I, all along I've recognised that this is a virus that doesn't respect borders. It doesn't know whether it's under the jurisdiction of the UK government or the jurisdiction of the Scottish government. So 
you know, cooperation across the four nations and, and globally is really important. Um, but equally, I've got a responsibility to do the things that I think are right for Scotland's circumstances. And, you know, we we developed at a slightly uh, slower pace than England. So we had our first case after uh, England, our first death after England. So when we imposed the lockdown measures, although that was on the same date as the rest of the UK, for Scotland, it actually was at a slightly earlier stage in the infection curve. So I, I've just tried to take the best decisions I can. I've, you know, politicians can be quite defensive about getting things wrong. It's it's kind of almost uh, in our DNA, but I've tried not to be. I, I've made mistakes. I, I don't think there'll be a person in, in my position leading a government anywhere in the world that hasn't made mistakes. Some of them will just be because I, I didn't know then things I know now, and, and some of them will be straightforward mistakes. And I think it's really important that we're honest about that. But what I do know, and it's the thing that, you know, I... It's important for me to, uh, for, for my own peace of mind to know, is that at every step we try to take the right decisions based on the best evidence we had. And I think that is the principle that really has to continue to guide us. What's been your biggest regret? My biggest regret is that we've uh, had more than 4,000 people die. I, I really don't want to, to be in a position where one person loses their life to a virus like this and uh, I certainly don't want to, to have the number of people that, that we've seen die, uh, die. Obviously, you know, the, the situation in care homes uh, was and still is deeply uh, upsetting for people and I, I share that sense of real upset about it. Um, I, I look just now at what's happening in, in Melbourne in Australia and they are dealing with a really significant issue in care homes as they, they grapple with community transmission. So none of these things have been unique to Scotland, but you know we have to look carefully at what we did. We have to learn as we go and we have to try to continue to take the best decisions we can because unfortunately, I wish I was sitting here having this interview with you now looking back because we were out of this pandemic, but as the situation in this, this week in Aberdeen demonstrates, we are still very much in this situation. And battling this virus for the foreseeable future possibly until there's a vaccine, and hopefully that will be relatively soon. But until then, battling this virus and trying to keep it under control is going to be a daily daily fight. And, and it's a fight that government has to lead, but it's a fight that each and every single one of us has to play our part in. And that is about the basic stuff, but really important stuff, washing your hands, wearing the face covering, uh, keeping two metres distance and, and making sure that if you've got symptoms, you're booking a test and self-isolating. The UK's Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir Patrick Valance, had said that the UK government was urged to impose full lockdown measures roughly a week earlier. Were you aware of that advice? Um, look, there's lots of advice. What I know is we took the decisions, uh, I took the decisions uh, and the Scottish government took the decisions based on the advice we had. Uh, for Scotland, of course, as I said earlier, it, although we went into lockdown on the same day as the rest of the UK, we were slightly earlier in the infection curve. Uh, at no point have we, uh, and. I can only speak for myself, but you know, at no point, and this is, we will have made mistakes, but the the notion that I always push back on is that somehow we just kind of blithely ignored advice or didn't think very carefully about these decisions. We took careful decisions based on the, the best advice that we had. And some of that with the benefit of hindsight, you know, you, you will think, I wish we'd done something else. But when you're in a situation like this, you have to take decisions there and then. And, you know, if you take the decision this week in Aberdeen, you know, maybe a few weeks from now, people will say to me, wasn't that an overreaction? I hope that's how it turns out, because that will mean that we've got it under control. But you have to act in the moment when you're dealing with an infectious virus. And that's what we've always tried to do. You said at the start of the pandemic, you felt a responsibility to work with the other UK nations. Is that still the case today? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I've just before I did this, uh, came down to do this interview. I'm just off a Four Nations call. Um, so yes, I, I this is an infectious virus. So it it, it doesn't respect the, the borders or the boundaries. We've got to try to coordinate. But my responsibility as First Minister is to take the decisions I think are right for Scotland. And, and I've tried to do that in a way uh, that is very straightforward in explaining those decisions. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll continue to try to get that balance right. If I think the, the circumstances in Scotland demand a, 
a different approach, I will take that different approach. Similarly, and you know, this is not a political comment, if I disagree with the decisions that, say, the UK government is taking, then I'll take a different decision there as well, because the only thing that matters here is trying to combat this virus and, and keep it under control. Aberdeen notwithstanding, we've got this virus at the moment under control in Scotland, but it will only stay there if we do everything that is required. You've already mentioned care homes and we've, we've talked about it extensively, so we won't go too in depth. But you did say that what happened in care homes is a matter of deep regret for you. If there is a second wave, what would you do differently? We're already doing things differently in care homes. Now, we've, we've followed advice every step of the way, but you know now we routinely, every single week now, uh, care home workers are being tested. So we already do things differently. Um, at the start of this pandemic, uh, again, we had a number of people in hospital, older people, delayed discharges as they're called. They didn't need to be in hospital. And usually in politics, governments uh, are getting hit over the head about not reducing delayed discharges. We knew that we were about to have an influx of coronavirus cases into hospitals. That wouldn't have been a safe place for older people either. So the discharge of older people into care homes, uh, or actually most older people discharged from hospital went to their own homes, but those who went into care homes there was a lot of careful thought into the, uh, the the clinical risk assessments that were done uh, for individuals, the policies and the guidance that was put in place. So I'm not on any aspect of our handling of this uh, pandemic saying there's nothing we could have done differently or we didn't get it wrong in any way because I, I think that would be a, an inconceivable position. But what I will absolutely maintain, uh, again, for as long as I live, is that we, we've thought deeply about every decision we took. We tried to base every decision on the knowledge and the evidence we had at the time um, and did our best to protect people against this virus as much as possible. And that's what we will continue to do for as long as we're living with it. We've been in filming in care homes and a big issue for the staff was the, the testing wasn't introduced early enough. Why wasn't it introduced early on? And what about PPE? How can we be sure there'll be enough PPE should there be another wave? Well, for, so on PPE, first of all, we, we did uh, you know significant things to make sure uh, that care homes had top up supplies of PPE. Obviously, the, the principal responsibility to provide PPE in care homes is, is on the the care home provider and and we've worked closely with Scottish Care and, and with the sector generally but we put in additional supply uh, routes and distribution routes for PPE so the government topped up those supplies and, and will continue to do that. On testing this is one of the the areas where um, the, the developing knowledge and understanding has been a factor and I'm not a clinician. I, I rely heavily on advice of experts uh, who know uh, about these things to, to form policy. At an earlier stage in this uh, pandemic, this was never black and white. So, you know, people sometimes say I'm suggesting that it was absolutely crystal clear. It's not been crystal clear at all, but there was a lot more doubt in the early stages about the, the role of asymptomatic uh, people in transmitting this virus, and also about the efficacy of the test with people who didn't have symptoms. Um, so th at that point, there was less, uh, less confidence that testing people without symptoms was a reasonable thing to do. Our thinking has changed on that. There's also, and I think this is the case even now when we do test uh, workers routinely in care homes, testing is never a panacea. You know, somebody can test negative one day, and be positive the next day because of the incubation. So testing is not a substitute for the other really important infection control and prevention measures that have to be in place in care homes. Let's talk about schooling. Your decision to reimpose restrictions in Aberdeen City was partly to ensure pupils can return to school. How secure are you in your decision to have schools go back full time? I, I think it is hugely important and I, I can't, you know, say that strongly enough to get young people back into education full time. Um, you know, again, with schools, we've taken the decisions that had to be taken, but young people have been out of school now for, well, since March. Um, and the impact on children's education, um, the impact on their well-being, their impact on just their interaction with peers and, and friends is not insignificant. And therefore, my view is that the top priority now has to be to get young people back into education. And if that means trade-offs elsewhere, if it means being a bit more um, 
precautionary when it comes to, as we have done in Aberdeen, closing down pubs for a period in order to protect that, then I think that's the action we've got to take. Clearly, uh, we, we need to take great care in schools. We've The decisions have all been informed by the advice of our uh, the subgroup of our scientific advisory group looking particularly at uh, children and uh, education issues. Uh, so they've guided us on physical distancing and, and their advice is, particularly for younger pupils, there is no requirement for physical distancing. Um, but there needs to be other measures in place from hygiene and uh, being uh, very vigilant about symptoms. So there'll be great care taken in and around schools, but getting children back into education is really important. And I, I think most people across the country would agree with that. It was still a bit of a surprise at the time when the announcement was made that children could go back full time. Was that a result of pressure from parents groups? It wasn't the result of, of course, we listened to parents and, and teachers. We've had the education recovery group uh, now for some time. The, uh, John Swinney chairs that. It involves local uh, government, teachers groups, parents groups. Uh, these decisions are, are never easy. Um, at an earlier stage, round about May, it looked, because of the prevalence of the virus in Scotland at that point, it looked at that time to us to be inconceivable that by August you could have children back in education full time. And that's why we put in place the blended learning contingency. Now, we then uh, managed to drive the virus to, to much lower levels than we dared hope we could back in May. And the balance of judgment changed. And as long as we keep prevalence really low, the judgment now is that children could, can go back full time. And I think everybody would agree that where possible, that should be the objective. But we've also been very clear that if prevalence of the virus increases or if there are localised spikes, it is possible that we will have to have a blended model uh, for a period in the future. We can't rule anything out. That's the most difficult thing in dealing with this virus. There is an inherent unpredictability and uncertainty. And politicians, just as we never usually are comfortable about admitting that we might have made mistakes, we're also really uncomfortable about not being able to say categorically that this will happen or that will happen. But when you're dealing with a virus like this, you can't be absolutely certain. Everything is predicated on all of us working together to keep this virus under control. And the more we do that, the more we can get life back to normal. Let's look back again at some other times from during the pandemic. Scotland's Chief Medical Officer, Catherine Calderwood, she resigned after making two trips to her second home. How disappointing was that time for you to lose that trusted voice? Um, Catherine was an incredibly trusted voice within the, the government uh, and particularly the handling the pandemic. She's somebody uh, that in a relatively short space of time since uh, you know we'd been dealing with the virus, I'd come to rely on very heavily. I thought she was doing a fantastic job. I wish she had been able to uh, carry on in, in government in the role as chief medical officer, but you know it became clear pretty quickly that her staying would undermine the confidence in the public health message. And to her credit, she recognised that and I was clear about that. And, and I suppose that was the important point. Above all else, we had to retain confidence in that message of stay at home as it was at the time. Um, so, you know, I you know, wish the whole episode hadn't happened, but we had to act in the interest of the overall pandemic response. And that's what happened. You have to make these big decisions and you walk into these daily briefings. Big decisions which affect lives. How does it feel at night with the weight of that <laughs> on your shoulders? Um, I'm usually pretty knackered by the time I get uh, home at night. Uh, that's not always to say I've managed to sleep well, but um, look, this is my job and I'm doing my job right now in, like all leaders of governments are, in unprecedented circumstances. So, you know, of course, that raises challenges that, you know, I've never had to face before. These are the most difficult decisions I've ever had to take. And it's the most difficult period I've ever gone through as, as First Minister. But it is fundamentally my job. And therefore, it's not people don't want to hear me moaning about the stresses and strains of it. Uh, my responsibility is to lead the country through it as safely as possible. And that's what I will focus on doing. I, I try to I try to, to focus on doing that job as much as possible, be as professional and as decisive as I, I can be. But I've also tried, particularly during the period where we were experiencing large numbers of people dying 
every day and, and every week, not to lose, it, not to get into a position where the sort of determination to do the, the job professionally made me immune to or lose sight of the human impact of all of this. I mean, I'm, I'm First Minister, but I've also got a sister who works in the front line of the health service, a sister-in-law who does so, you know, my niece and nephews have had their education disrupted in, in the same way that other young people have. So I've experienced this whole um, sort of period so far, obviously from a different perspective as First Minister, but a lot of the, the human impact on, of it, I've felt as well, not being able to see my, my family for a long period of time and trying to, to just remember the human impact of what people are going through and, and feed that into the decision making I've, I've tried to do to the best of my ability. But, um, you know, I've, I've not got every decision right and I've not, uh, I've not got it right at every turn and, and you know, I'll reflect on these decisions for, as I, I say often, probably for as long as I live, but I'll continue to try to do the best I can. What has been your darkest hour over the last few months? Um, I, I think I'd struggle to, you know, I know you're not asking me literally for one hour, but at, at the, in the depth of, uh, you know, April, May, when the care home situation was at its worst, when the, the, the peak of the deaths were uh, at, at the highest, you know, that that was awful. And, and that's where, when I did the daily briefings every day, that conscious um, effort to make sure that as I was reading out statistics, I was remembering the people behind those statistics, not that I knew them all personally, but just remembering the human impact of that. That was... That was the, that, that was a tough period, but you know I, I I don't want to sound cliched or but you know however tough it might have been for me that is as nothing compared to those working on the front line or those suffering bereavement and you know this has been a really really difficult period for the whole country. It's a difficult period for the world and we're not out of it yet and we just have to keep doing the right things to get this thing under control and hopefully hopefully, I cross my fingers as I say this, in the not too distant future, science will help us out through vaccine and, and treatments. But until that point, this is a daily battle against an infectious virus. I talked earlier on about the things we've learned. Um, some of the things we've learned rem should remind us of how important it is to keep this thing under control, because it is really infectious, much more so than I might have thought all these months ago. And it does real damage to people. So even people who don't die from this, it's a minority of people who die from this, but some of what we're learning now about the long-term impact on people's health is really worrying. And so what I'd say to people is, do everything you possibly can to avoid getting this virus um, yourself and everything you can to uh, avoid any risk of passing it on to others. How has the pandemic changed you personally? Is the Nicola Sturgeon sitting in front of me today the same as the Nicola Sturgeon at the start of the year? Uh, no, I, I don't think, look, I'm, I'm the same human being. I'm not saying I have fundamentally uh, changed as a person, but but I think I, I think this experience has changed me and will change me. Um, I, I don't think I'll be the same person completely coming out of this as I was going into it. But while I can say that, I haven't had time to properly think about what what I actually mean by that. It's just a really strong feeling I've got. There are things already, and, and who knows, maybe in a year's time, I'll look back and laugh at what I'm about to say, but I, I do find I've got a much lower tolerance for for some of the kind of things that I've been as guilty of as any other politician, but just some of the really, you know, silly, pointless, overly tribal aspects of politics. Because the last few months have reminded us of the fact that we're dealing with bigger issues and actually... Uh, we've all been, as human beings, united in this fight against a virus. So, yeah, I, I think I will have been changed by this, but it might take me a, a lot longer than I've had so far to really process what I mean by that. You're talking about bigger issues as well. Let's talk about the economy. Obviously, we're still in the pandemic, but attention is now turning to our economy. Can it recover? Will it recover? How long will it take? Um, yes, the economy will recover. Um, I don't think any of us can say uh, exactly what that time frame is right now. I think there is also a real opportunity to think about the kind of economy we want to build out of this pandemic. We had a real focus on the 
uh, net zero climate change transition going into it, I think that becomes even more important and gives us opportunities in terms of economic, uh, the shape of the economy as well. Uh, these are uh, issues that take up uh, a huge and growing amount of the time and, and thinking of the government. Uh, but we can't lose sight of the fact that the, the best foundation, the only sustainable foundation for economic recovery is coronavirus under control, because if we allow it to run out of control again, economic recovery will be set back. And we're seeing that in Aberdeen, where hospitality had opened, it's now closed again. We've got to, to continue to work to keep this thing suppressed so that we can avoid as far as possible that start-stop approach, which will be much more damaging to the economy, medium uh, to longer term. The Scottish Parliament election next year will be an unusual campaign. How comfortable are you at holding an election if the virus is still present? Well, look, my strong view is the election should go ahead. Um, that said, I've not had time to think about it at all in the last four months. Uh, but, you know, it's really important that democracy continues. And in times of crisis like this, it is even more important that people can scrutinise and, and make decisions about who is in the position and who has the responsibility to lead the country through. The Scottish Parliament uh, cross-party will have to look at whether there are changes to how the election is conducted and obviously the the, the trajectory of the virus will be a, a factor in that. It may be that you know more postal voting is important but it, I think it's important that these decisions are are considered carefully on that cross-party basis and conclusions reached but if, as far as possible I think we should all be determined to make sure the election can proceed. Obviously, the pandemic has taken up virtually all of your time, but in the coming weeks, your focus will turn to the inquiry and to the handling of complaints against Alex Salmond. He was your mentor, he was your friend. How difficult will that inquiry be for you? Um, look, I don't relish it. Um, I, I don't think anybody would, uh, something like this. And obviously the personal you know, implications of all of this are you know, are difficult and uh, I, won't, uh, I won't say any more than that. So I don't relish it, but there will also be a bit of a sense of relief to get to put for the first time, you know, my, my side of things um, and, you know, I'll get that opportunity. It's a committee inquiry, so obviously I'm going to respect that process and, and give my, my detailed views directly to the committee and they'll have the opportunity to ask me questions about that. Um, and, you know, that's that's a process that I will have to go through. But let me be very clear, my my focus for the foreseeable future as First Minister by necessity has to be on COVID uh, because if we take our eye off the ball of tackling COVID even for a day, a week, then it can very quickly run out of control. So I'm going to be very, very uh, disciplined to make sure that the, the whole government keeps its eye on that ball because the, the consequences of not would be too great for the country. As you say, it's a time when people need to listen. Are you worried that the inquiry might undermine any confidence in the government? No, at a look, time when they should be listening? I, I think these, these things will happen and, and you know, they, they will take uh, their due course and due process will happen. Um, and you know, my job is to, of course, cooperate fully with that, which I, I will do, um, but also make sure that whether it's that or anything else that might be threatening to, uh, to, to take the, the government's attention away from COVID, that we don't lose that focus on COVID. Um, you know, I've been saying for weeks now to people that, you know, this can very quickly run out of control again. I mean, I've, for the past two weeks or more now, actually, we've reported every single day no registered deaths. And that's such a relief after what we've been talking about with the, the peak of deaths um, earlier this year. But I also know, uh, and don't get me wrong, I, I don't want that to change, but I also know that when people hear that day in and day out, no deaths, there's an inevitable human reaction that must be the risk has gone away and and that's what's really dangerous that we drop our guard against this virus and we've seen in Aberdeen how quickly it can all turn we've seen in other countries you know Australia and Victoria uh, in Australia not that long ago had levels of this virus lower than Scotland and now you know they're in lockdown again and cases are soaring it's an infectious virus. It will take every opportunity we give it to spread and to spread quickly. So we must, all of us, government must keep its eye on this ball, but every single one of us have to do that. It's more important than ever now that we follow all that, that facts advice that I keep talking about. Face coverings, avoid crowded places, clean your hands and hard surfaces, two metres distancing and self-isolate and book a test. We've got to follow that or this virus will take a grip of us again.
First Minister, thank you very much for taking thank the you. time to speak to STV News. Thank you.